Welcome to Industrial Marketing Live. I'm Peyton Warren. I'm a strategist here at uh, the industrial marketing agency, Gorilla76, and I'm one of your IML hosts. Um, to our crowd that's joining us in person today, thank you for being here. We're super excited to hear what you have to say um, on this topic. We had a topic request from IMLer Abby uh, to talk more about HubSpot. I think their request was kind of a HubSpot 101. Um, we know not all of you use HubSpot um, and not all of you have it in your tech stack. So we're trying to do our best to like kind of zoom out and share learnings that are more specific to the manufacturing sector, things that maybe you could even apply no matter what your CRM or um, marketing automation platform are. Um, so we're also going to try and zoom in and give you some platform tips today. Um, but we felt like this was the perfect opportunity to um, bring in the lovely Charlie Vlietstra. I pronounced that right, Charlie? You nailed it. Yeah. I think the, the phonetic spelling that I gave you might have helped because it's kind of brutal. But yes, you got it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Uh, so Charlie Vlietstra is um, a channel account manager over at HubSpot, and he's our dedicated HubSpot rep for Gorilla76. So we know Charlie pretty well. Uh, he's helped us out if... Uh, you work with Gorilla and you're listening to this, he's probably helped us out on your HubSpot account too. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're super excited to have Charlie here and um, we get to work with him quite a bit. So now we're going to share him a little bit with you. Um, Charlie, I'd love for you just to kind of say hello, introduce yourself, tell, tell the crowd a little bit more about you and kind of how you got to HubSpot. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you, Peyton, for the, for the intro. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to join you guys. I've been working with Gorilla76 for, I think, a bit over a year now. Um, and I work on the, the partner solution side at HubSpot. So I work with about 40 different partners, um, like across um, different industries, but just partners being uh, HubSpot, or HubSpot agencies, like ad agencies that service HubSpot. And uh, my journey, I guess, to joining HubSpot was I was in the digital marketing seat for a number of years, um, like mostly on the client side, eventually the agency side, um, and just really like fell in love with the tool um, and just like would work in there. I was in performance marketing and then kind of did more like strategy and then was like the HubSpot guy, like CRM marketing. Um, and so it just like was kind of a natural um, like fit um, moving from, I moved from an agency, you know, to HubSpot. Um, and so, yeah, so now I work with 40 partners and I, I'm excited to talk with you guys today because what I find interesting is that of my 40 partners, there's only three of them that service one industry exclusively. And that industry in all, across all three agencies is the manufacturing industry. Um, and I think there's a really good reason for that. I mean, we can dig into that a little bit more as well, but, um, you know, I think, you know, talking about the challenges that you're facing in your industry um, I can probably speak to some of those and how technology can solve for that. But, but yeah, it's been awesome working with G76 and looking forward to a discussion today and um, answering any questions you guys have. Awesome. 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 Well, yeah, maybe to get us started, I think it's really cool that you've been able to get like a, a window into the manufacturing sector through these different agencies that you work with. Um, Curious to know, like, what has, what have you seen that's been consistently important for those manufacturing partners um, and what they're trying to get out of their tech stack, um, what they're trying to get out of HubSpot? Yeah, um, so I think, I, I guess, like, relating it back to, to the challenges, right? I think um, it's funny, we have this whole page about manufacturing and this whole, like, slide deck and the four challenges we call out are outdated or non-existent technology, um, content creation, and then targeting, and then limited resources. So that being resources internally, being like a one person kind of like marketing shop um, or marketing department rather, and then uh, limited budgets as well. Not necessarily that you have like small revenue, a lot of manufacturing companies bring in a lot of revenue, but sometimes that budget isn't being allocated to um, you know, to technology and to marketing. So I think like if I were to summarize it without digging in too much and we can do that, but it's understand that your 
industry is very specific. Your buyer personas are very kind of nuanced. You have distributors and then you have customers and you have to speak to those people differently and you have to reach them differently. Um, so really understanding kind of like what their buying motivations are and then having very targeted approaches, you know, to reach them um, at whatever stage of the buyer's journey they're at is incredibly important because you guys aren't, you know, selling shoes to the masses. You're selling to maybe like, I don't know, mid-level plant managers or something, right? Like buying a very specific part or, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So it's, you know, how do we leverage technology and data to ultimately, you know, get in front of those people and a tool and that, you know, I promised uh, G76, this wouldn't be a sales pitch on, on HubSpot. So I, I'm gonna steer away from that, but having a, a system like a CRM in general to, you know, leverage that first party data to get in front of the right people is, is definitely critical for um, any manufacturing business. Yeah, what I'm seeing in the chat already is just, like you said, Charlie, one of the big things is that, you know, whenever you're trying to get a tool, they tools like this can be very, very expensive. And um, you don't always use all of the functions that are built in to those platforms or whatever. So yep. I think that's kind of a an interesting thing. Um, like, how do you even know when it's the right time for you to get a CRM or a marketing automation tool? And like, how do you reason through that investment? Because mm -hmm. if you're not spending anything and you're just using an Excel spreadsheet, when you look at the cost of a tool um, like a HubSpot, you're like, oh man, that's, <laughs> that's a lot of money I wasn't spending before. But um, I think, and we'll kind of probably talk more about this today. Like there's a lot you get out of that um, as far as like what you're um, able to understand about your business. Um, understand about what activities are working um, for you, understanding where your leads are coming from and which ones are actually turning into business. I mean, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add, Charlie, Brendan. Mm. Yeah, and Brendan, always yeah, feel free to hop in. I know you have a lot of um, good thoughts and good experience with this as well, but yeah, it is, it can be a big investment for sure. Um, like if you're just looking at the, you know, the, the dollars and cents of what you'd, you'd be paying for the tool. Um, of course, you know, there's the argument that the cost of not having a tool like this is, you know, it's pretty extreme too, um, in terms of, you know, revenue loss and, um, and, and that sort of thing. But I, what I will say is, you know, with HubSpot and with other tools too, there, there tend to be tiers and levels. So you wouldn't necessarily have to get started on something that's going to ultimately break the bank. You can get your feet wet and kind of more of the, starter pro tools and then, and then grow into it. But uh, in terms of ROI, I mean, that's ultimately like what you guys care about um, at the end of the day. I know at least most of you. So it's um, being able to justify any investment in marketing and sales and tie it back to ROI can be difficult, but I would say with the CRM, it's actually like the easiest out of all of the tools or things are like even trade shows, like you're going to trade shows anyway. Right. So it's, um, helping you tie the, like, we call it like full funnel attribution, like helping you, helping you, you know, connect that circle of, okay, this is what we're doing in our marketing efforts. And, and this is what's coming back to us. We're going to this trade show. We have this very, we have this tracking code, you know, URL that we're dropping to, uh, you know, on this landing page. And we're seeing that these contacts are converting and ultimately this many are becoming customers. And so we made this much money on the trade show. Um, or this person came in from our website and I can see, wow, they came in from a, a Google ad, right? Um, and more specifically, you, you can, in a CRM, you can click in and see which campaign they came from and even which ad. So you, you're able to see which ads are working, which campaigns are working, how much you've spent on those, those campaigns and like within those channels. So say you're spending, you know, um, you know, say you have a pretty decent budget, like 10K a month on Google ads, like that's a lot of money. Well, maybe you're getting $50,000 a month back in, um, you know, in, in new customer revenue without, and I came from performance marketing without that, um, the, the CRM to tie the full circle. You can see like, okay, we got this many conversions, but like, who are they? Like what, 
um, like who specifically is converting, like, and, and what is the lifetime value of those customers? Um, so, you know, being able to have that attribution is just really huge in terms of, you know, justifying the investment, which I think on the front end can be scary because it's a lot of money, but down the road, especially at year end when you're using the tool correctly and you're working with partners like G76 um, to help you, you know, fully utilize it, um, the, the ROI is there. And then, you, you know, you can look like, look like a hero because once you can show that it doesn't seem like as, you know, as big of a, a cost necessarily. Yeah, I, Charlie, that, that's all great. And from my perspective, it just makes you much more effective in doing everything, right? Like I think as, as marketers, you know, like we have this like this creative side and this critical thinking side that we're always kind of playing off of each other. And on the critical thinking side, like you need data. And to just think like, I'm going to put in this information into a spreadsheet, like, well, you just, so you're going to put a name, a company and an email address into your spreadsheet, like, and maybe the deal size. So like, you're missing all of the marketing information. You have no idea what's actually working. And so you're just going to keep doing what you think is working without actually putting any thought or critical thinking or analysis into any of your programs to make any change and business is changing, right? Like we've talked about this like so much over the last year, the way people buy is changing. People are going to the internet way more. And so you need tools like this to pull out that information so you can make good decisions. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, so you know, yeah. Just to piggyback off of that too, some stats that we call out in terms of people going to the internet to make decisions for manufacturing. I feel like there can be a misconception that manufacturing customers buy through relationships, which can be true or, um, you know, like, oh, we've always worked with this company, that sort of a thing, which is absolutely true. But 84% um, of customers in manufacturing use search engines to, to find, you know, the, their product or to, to do research on, you know, products that they're, that they're going to buy. Um, and then another interesting stat is that 70% of manufacturers attend edu educational webinars or have attended educational webinars in the last 12 months. So something like this. Um, so there's an appetite, like a digital kind of like appetite, right, for uh, information. And it's not just through the more traditional, um, I guess, like sources that I think some people think. We are getting a lot of questions in the chat. So yeah, I was going to say, um, Jared, let's uh, let's have you unmute and let's have you ask your question about um, old contacts. So Charlie, we're getting a lot of like really tactical stuff in here. So yeah. we're going to, um, you know, how do we make the CRM work better? And I think this, a lot of this stuff is going to be pertinent across a lot of different CRMs. Uh, but so Jared, yeah, come on in here and let's talk about your question. Yeah, uh, Charlie, uh, one of the things I run into a lot is uh, whenever we have emails go out, I get kickbacks of, you know, so-and-so is no longer at the company or so-and-so is retired. Uh, and so I, I've come up with my own internal system of, of creating lead statuses that are marked as such to keep them in the system because I've gotten pushback on removing them from the CRM. Um, so I was curious what value you might suggest or, or if, is it better to just remove people out of the system to clear things out so it's not bogged down, um, assuming that all the pertinent information has been associated on the company level as well, which it typically automatically is. Yeah, that's a great question, Jared. Um, I think in those, it kind of, it might depend on the situation a bit, right? Um, but I'd say generally speaking, it's always good to, you know, keep your CRM as full of data as possible. Um, uh, of course, you know, the more marketing contacts you have, the more expensive it can get because um, that's part of the pricing model. So what you can do in those scenarios is set somebody as a non-marketing contact just to maintain their historical data in your CRM for, you know, to see if you've emailed them in the past, what conversations were had, um, you know, what their, what their job title is, what company they used to be associated with. All of that can be used uh, down the road for for a, a variety of reasons but um, I think like owning your data especially because of the shift now and that third-party data is is getting harder and harder to to get with all of the privacy like owning your first party data is you know is really critical um, and if somebody's moved on or they're not interested in buying at the moment or whatever reason it might be you might want to toggle them off as a non-marketing contact uh, but I would say like keep them in the system and, um, you know, if you, 
use that data down the road. It's, you know, it's there. And if you don't, there's, you know, no harm. Yeah, I would agree with Charlie there too, because you don't want to delete data just, and Jared, like you said, you've come up with a system to organize it. You've got statuses so you can easily filter them out of reports or anything like that. But as long as the data, like that data can still be very helpful if you're going back and doing a dig, or if you wanted to see what worked five years ago before they retired and, you know, different things like that. So I would totally agree with uh, with Charlie there and what you're already doing um, as a good solution. But definitely want to exclude them as a marketing contact if they're, if they're not able to respond to emails anymore. Don't let them up your cost. Yeah. One thing that I just thought of too is, so marketing contacts are folks you can, you know, obviously market to that can be email, but then you can also use them um, in an audience, right? So you can create a list of people in your CRM and um, add them as an audience into your paid campaigns, like on LinkedIn or, or on um, Facebook. So there might be value. So if there's somebody who's at a company who leaves, uh, but Facebook or LinkedIn is still able to identify who that is, you could keep them in a list, um, maybe send, them, maybe unsubscribe them from emails, but then assuming they may have moved to another manufacturing company that and could be a buyer at another company, keep them in your, keep them in your ads, right? And continue to, um, continue to, to market to them that way. Nice. All right. Next question is from Colleen. Colleen, if you are comfortable with it, please come off mute and uh, ask your question. But it's more just like, how do you get buy-in from leadership on, on HubSpot? So um, give Colleen a minute here if she wants to jump. Let's see. Yeah. <clears throat> Welcome to IML. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I just, um, there was zero like customer management when I started at my current role. And so, and I was actually, I'm not like, wasn't like fluent in any of the systems, but I kind of like leaned into HubSpot because of it, like the way it was designed, et cetera. So, um, so I've been working really hard to like use as many tools as I can and like showing how it works just with like the free version. Um, but honestly, like the rep I was talking to at HubSpot, like I would get so excited with her on the phone. And then I don't know, just, I would, oh, I just keep getting shot down as far as like bending on this. And I'm trying to like use my sales team to help just to show them like, Hey, this is what you can do. You won't have to do, cause they're doing a lot of extra work manually, just like managing their own customers. So, um, anyway, so I don't know if you have any, like major since you're fluent in like manufacturing if you have any like tips that I can use to sell it I mean I'm obviously I'm writing down like any stats you have or any of that stuff um you know we've kind of we just started we just added in a like a quoting software which I know that does have a Zapier plugin that will connect to HubSpot um but I don't know I've been pushing for at least a year so <laughs> I don't know if you have any what's that what objections are you getting? Um, cost or you can find all the information in QuickBooks mm. or our quoting software will have that. Um, it, it, more of those things, but like I am the single marketer. So I'm like, yes, and that doesn't help me do my job. So <laughs> anyway, yep. that's just overall. Yep. Yep. Um, thanks for asking that. And just to give you kind of like a stat to maybe go back to them with, um, we talked about this, Peyton, uh, I think in one of our meetings and you really like the stats, so I'm going to share it. Um, so according to, this is a Harvard Business Review study, which analyzed like 15,000 unique leads and 100,000 call attempts. Um, you actually mm -hmm. increase your odds of qualifying a lead by 400% when your response time goes from um, five minutes to 10 minutes. So thinking about like a system that helps you like automate, you know, what you're doing and follow up with leads, I think can be helpful for, for leadership in the sales team. But I would say, you know, it's the, you say you get excited when you talk to the HubSpot rep and that's great. I think having that HubSpot rep, you know, ha like bringing in your leadership team to those conversations as well. And, and like Brennan asked, like, what are the pain points? Like, 
if, if he's able to, or he or she is able to draw those pain points and ask the right questions to leadership and to your team and say, okay, what challenge are you, what challenges are you having? And they might not even know, right? They might not even know which, uh, what, what challenges they face because they're comfortable in the tools that they're in. Um, you mentioned that there's quoting software. Well, actually um, HubSpot has quoting software within the tool. So not only mm -hmm. is it a CRM and a bunch of other things, you can do quoting in there. Um, so you can, you can draw like, okay, what are your pain points? What existing software do you have? How can we consolidate your tech stack? Because that's one of the things too with HubSpot is it's an all-in-one platform. So you're not mm -hmm. only just getting a you know, marketing tool. It's there's five products. There's marketing, sales, customer service, um, CMS and operations. And then within mm -hmm. those hubs, there's a bunch of different tools. So you can a lot of times save money on canceling other tools. Um, mm -hmm. But then, but then, yeah, it's, I mean, every conversation is so very different and the value of HubSpot is so very different for each business. So I think you see the value as a marketer. Um, it's going to save you time. That's a, that's a selling point for leadership to giving you some time back. Um, but I think, mm -hmm. you know, bringing them into those conversations and just um, having everybody on the same page, I think will really help um, help you get by and so that you're not kind of like the, the middleman or middle woman per se to uh, yeah. go back and forth and, and have to relay the information that you're getting from the rep. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll try. <laughs> I'm down. <laughs> like, and I think maybe now is, now is the time since we're kind of, I don't know, we need to this other, like the software is, it's like was fully customized for us. So um, yeah, maybe now, is the, now we'll have more time to like bring them in and listen more so we'll the, other, the other thing <laughs> i'd add to that colleen is just you know um hubspot doesn't have to replace all these tools either like hubspot plays right. really well with um with like other softwares it integrates with things um mm -hmm. but what it's going to give you is visibility into your funnel from the time that someone fills out the very first form on your website mm -hmm. you're going to be able to see what pages they interacted with, what content they interacted with, um, maybe how right. many times they've been to your website. If you have them in an email nurture flow, it's all there in the CRM. And then you can pull in information to add color from those tools that your team really likes. So mm -hmm. you don't have to say, oh, the sales team is going to have to learn how to use this new quoting software either. Like you could just say, y'all are getting this really great data, but I need to be able to like play with it and analyze yeah. it without interrupting your flow. And right. so if anything, it's like, it's creating a really like safe ecosystem for marketing mm -hmm. to analyze without having to, you know, um, maybe change things that are tied to how um, quotes are going out and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm telling them a lot, like recently, just even just my sales team, like, I don't want you guys to do more work in more spreadsheets and more stuff. Like I, it's all there, but I want to try to save you time, <laughs> yeah. which will eventually save me time. So, so anyway. The way I think about this is you might need to just do some calculation. Like how much time are you spending using the current tools you have times yeah. that by what you make per hour and do the same thing with yeah. your sales team, right? So I have a feeling that probably makes more, that costs more than $800 a month. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I see uh, Joel Wittenbacher at Brocker on this call. Uh, Joel, would you appreciate understanding that as a leader of MacTech, knowing uh, you know how much Luke has spent wasting in a old CRM compared to you know going to a new platform? Do you like him wasting time? Oh, I've become accustomed to it over time. <laughs> I'm pretty much used to it, but but I don't I don't get upset by it because it's a genetic thing. So it's all right. I know where you got it. No, absolutely. Um, and Luke, Luke drives the marketing in our firm, and uh, and he's taught taught us and me a lot about knowing that data. It's just otherwise you're just in the you're just in the fog the whole time. But I can make decisions. I can say no, we're not going to spend this money anymore. We're, it's just it's not worth it. Or we're gonna okay, we're gonna blast. We're gonna try this. We're gonna do ninety days, one hundred eighty days, or whatever. Give it some time. But then at the end of that rope, we just say, okay, roll or, or stop. So it's, uh, no, that data is crucial. And that's good. And I mean, we've had a lot of happy success lately with uh, some of these things too. So thanks to you guys. Thanks, Joel. Yeah. So Colleen, just like, yeah, look at how much t time and money is your leadership wasting on you guys using these outdated 
inefficient tools, and then maybe have your leadership talk to another company's leadership, you know, find a Joel that they trust that is using a CRM and talk about the impact that that's had on their company. Okay. If you Love buy, it. if you buy Joel a beer, he will talk to anybody. So <laughs> absolutely. I'm, on so it. I'm putting it out there. That's I'm absolutely out there true. You, Colleen, Peyton and Brendan have his contact info. Just reach out and they'll give it to you. <laughs> Yeah, we give it to easy, everyone. Easy. <laughs> but remember, <laughs> but the thing you ought to know is that unlike your managers, I can tell you that right now, Colleen, is that I don't want people messing around searching for the last penny in, in value right. in things we do in the organization. I don't like people spending their time searching for airfares and this. I want them selling stuff to people. I want them communicating. I want them engaging. And that's where I want, that's why this information is so crucial in my mind that the marketing data. Give me more data so the operating people and the sales people can engage with more people. That's that's the whole game. And everything else is noise, you know. If we pay 5% more for our airfares or our toner packages, I don't really care. It's it's just immaterial to the big picture. Right. Yeah. Love that point. Thank you. Such a great uh, conversation, Colleen. Thanks so much for sharing. All right. Next question is from Beth Bauer at Fullerton Tool. So she's having some issues, it looks like, getting a sales team to use the tool that they already have. So Beth, why don't you come on and talk about uh, what's, what's going on with you? Yep. So we utilize HubSpot from a marketing standpoint here, um, but we just struggle and struggle to get our sales team to utilize the CRM, deals, pipeline, all of that. And I was just wondering if you had any tips or tricks to help get them to adopt using it yeah so are they using so you have the, the marketing hub as well as the sales hub and is, is the idea that the sales team uses that for deal management and follow-up tasks and all of that yep and our sales team currently like does not have a current process or anything like that everyone's just sort of rogue doing their own thing <laughs> uh, that's yeah that is a common story. That's not the first time I don't think any any one of us have heard that. Um, are they, um, so that they're, they're following up with leads, but just kind of using their own systems, whether that be like some using a spreadsheet and some using HubSpot and some like maybe using a notepad type of thing? Yep, I would say so. Okay. Oh man, um, that can be, it can be challenging. Um, I think, I think like bringing them together and asking, you know, what their processes are and, and probably understanding, um, right? Like what, what is preventing them from, from using the tools would be a good place to start. Um, I think a, a lot of the times it's training is the missing piece, whether that's they haven't invested the time to, to learn the tool themselves because they're intimidated by it. That can be, you know, a, a common thing. So with, with HubSpot, and again, don't want to make this all about HubSpot, but because you're using HubSpot, it's uh we have the HubSpot Academy, right? So if there's those those video classes that sales teams can take to say how do you how do you best utilize uh, the tool? There's lessons that they can go through. It's very interactive. Um, that's more of the self service right type of training. And then of course um, leaning on partners as well um, to to customize that training for your business um, and getting in there and like essentially empowering them to 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 use the tool, but I don't think it's, I think the first step is really understanding, right? Like where they're at and what's preventing them from, from fully utilizing it. Um, because at the end of the day, it's going to save them time. It's going to make them more effective. And until they realize that um, there's just, there might be some pushback um, or some, you know, just the adoption might not be there. So I would actually, I actually have a question, I guess, on this for G76, like, have you guys run into this? And as an agency, like how have you helped sales teams like better adopt, you know, like the, a sales product, whether it be Salesforce or, or HubSpot, like how do you get them in the deals and, um, and actually leveraging this data and using the tools to follow up? There's two, th two things that I think of right off the top of the bat is one, how can you make it simpler for them? Like, what do you really need from sales? and um, like what properties do you really need them to fill out? Um, I've seen in some of my client um, HubSpots, we've created like internal forms. So you can send a form 
to um, a sales rep and say, what's the status of this lead? And they just click a toggle and then it automatically updates your HubSpot because it's all connected back to those properties and those fields. So you're still having to do the manual process of reaching out and following up, but even that you can automate um, with these tools too, if you wanted to follow up just on a weekly basis, if it hasn't been updated. Um, the other thing um, that comes to mind is, uh, well, just lost that one, but Brendan, you, you had some ideas. <laughs> yeah, we hear this all the time. Uh, and I dealt with this when I was in house too. We like the way that we do things. I can track all of my deals in this notebook and I am effective at my job. But the problem is it doesn't give us any insight into where things are at for the business, right? Like the, like it, this is a bit, it's not a marketing tool. This is a business tool. We've said this in the chat. We've said this a lot, you know, CRMs are business tools. And I, to me, like is, this is just table stakes, I think, for a modern salesperson. Like this is how we track deals. And I'm sorry if you don't like that anymore. Don't be a salesperson anymore. That's kind of like my feeling on this, really. Um, and so, like, I think you know, you have to get buy-in from sales leadership, right? I think you know, if I was a VP of sales or head of sales, like understanding where my pipeline is at all the time and how are my sales people performing, how are my regions doing, um, that is information I would like to know. And then as a marketer, like, I want to know, like, did this Google ads campaign, did this Facebook campaign, did this LinkedIn campaign, did this email or trade show campaign, are those leading in to a tributal pipeline to things that we're doing in the marketing side? And I can't, I can't know that if sales isn't inputting information in there. And I think a lot of the issue too is, you know, you go to create your HubSpot instance or your Salesforce instance or pipeline or pipe driver Zoho, and you put in all the fields, like, we're just going to put all the fields in here. And then nobody ever fills those out. So maybe we need to go back into like our deal properties and our contact properties and get rid of the ones that we aren't using and we are never going to use um, and just make like make it way easier for people to use. Um, show them that they can use it on their phone or their tablet, uh, you know, when they're out on the road. Um, I think, uh, Jared, uh, you had a question way earlier in the meeting about is uh, HubSpot ever going to get uh, talk to text uh, on, in the app. Uh, so that was one thing, Charlie, if you have any say into the product team, like Jared wants mm -hmm. talk to text. <laughs> <laughs> on the app. Um, so like, but, you know, have that conversation with the sales leadership and then, you know, carrot or stick kind of thing. I, I think, you know, like, is there any incentives that the sales team can have to do their job? I don't know why sales always needs incentives to do their job. I don't have an incentive to do my job. It's just having a job. So I don't know about all that, but um, there's probably some carrot or stick thing that needs to get worked out with sales too, to, to get them to do what they're supposed to do, I guess. <laughs> Uh, so Katie asked in the chat to um, just about like an example of that, like internal, like here's a button, click this button sales to update the lead information. I just want to show you really quick. Like this is how simple your form can be. And you don't have to put it on a web page. You don't have to do anything like that. This can be embedded in an email. This can be like, this is a HubSpot form. And it's literally just a little like, are they an opportunity customer or other? If they're other, explain. And you could be sending this out um, for any leads that you think were, you know, exciting leads that came in through forms. Um, so this is how um, one of my clients does it. But I know that there's lots of other ways. Just wanted to share. It could be as simple as yeah. that. And you can require those those fields. And when you're moving people through deal stages, right? First step is getting them to use the deals and move them through the deal stages. But for added accountability, I mean, you can literally set the system up to say, you won't be able to move it to this deal stage unless this information is filled out, right? So um, that's just nice, right? You can make sure that you're getting the information <laughs> that you need. Um, yeah, and make it so that they can't do their job if they're not giving you that information. And from the marketing side, I think what I would do is, you know, have a standing meeting with sales leadership and then just constantly bring them leads. Here's all the leads that we brought in via our form uh, in the last month and they haven't been followed up with, right? Like, so here, and then here's all the money that we just wasted in marketing, uh, getting these leads in here and nothing happened, right? Like, and then you can start bringing that to leadership and start getting movement that way. You know, you have to give people an, uh, an incentive to move out of their current behaviors. And I think that would be one of them. <laughs> awesome. Um, one of the things that we wanted to talk about today too, and it's kind of come up a little bit, is just like the ease of use. Um, and that's been 
one reason why it's really nice for these small marketing teams is you don't have to be like a developer to get in and like build forms that can then go on your website or integrate um, your CRM with things like your website or Zoom or go to meeting or whatever platforms you're using. Um, yeah, Charlie, I'm curious, like if you have anything to add there just around like how you can make your life easier <laughs> with, with HubSpot and ultimately save time. Yeah, it's a good question. I'm trying to keep up in the chat too, but there's so oh, many I know. questions and dialogue. I'm like, I'm falling behind. So <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so ease of use. Uh, I think that can be like new technology can be like the, the big, a big barrier can just be like, Hey, this, this is intimidating. I, you know, I've heard you need an admin to do things like that. And so HubSpot was very much built on, on, you know, empowering users, whether you're, um, you know, just an everyday marketer or salesperson, um, or office admin, right. To, to use the tool. And then of course there are more advanced options for like the developers, but, um, but it's, it's really a tool for all, all people. Like, someone mentioned, I think it was you, Peyton, that it's a, it's a business tool. It's not, you know, not knocking on Salesforce, but Salesforce is a sales tool and it, re it does require an admin a lot of the time. Um, so I think like having the right software to um, empower you and, and make your life easier is, is important, but then also all of the like automations and things in place um, that are going to save you time um, is really important to call out as well. So um, you can do things like Going back to that example of moving people from from deal stages, if we're just going back to the, the sales product, maybe you know when when you move them into like quote ready stage, you can have that create a task for you to then um, to say, hey, you need to create this quote, right? So you're removing that kind of like manual process of saying, okay, this is what I need to do at this deal stage, and things aren't falling through the cracks. Um, so it's ease of use and the ability to make you more efficient and save you time. And, and then lastly, um, right, I think we, we touched on it with the integrations is that you don't have to be like all in on a certain software, like with HubSpot, you know, you can integrate with other tools as well. If you're married to Salesforce, there is a native Salesforce uh, integration for that reason. Sometimes, you know, sales um, teams are been using the tool for years and it's really hard to, to get them to get off of it. And so we can, you know, integrate with those and I think there's over a thousand now native integrations in our app marketplace um, to help you, you know, better use the tools that you are using, um, and you know, make make your your job and you know easier and HubSpot an, an, an easier tool for you to use. So hopefully that answers your question. I realize it was kind of long winded, but um, <laughs> that's uh, yeah, kind of a lot there. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd add there is just about, um, and we, we've kind of touched on this a little bit about just overall like integrations. Um, so like I kind of showed a little bit, uh, or we've talked a little bit about workflows that might be like a HubSpot 102 um, sort of uh, IML session, but because there's, you can do internal workflows, external workflows, updating like data cleaning workflows, all different sorts of things there um but you can what you want to do in hubspot is basically just create a central hub for all of your data so if you are nice I, yeah. Whoa. um so if you are executing like a webinar series you can go through the app marketplace in hubspot free integrations with um zoom go to meeting like i mentioned different things like that um, so that when someone fills out a registration for a Zoom event, they're automatically getting pulled into your HubSpot. Like you're saving yourself time in that way as well. Um, same thing if you are going to be using like a QR code at a trade show and you want to add um, not just like a normal URL to that link, but a tracking URL from HubSpot. You can assign that tracking URL to a campaign and like all of these things just build on top of each other to give you more insight into where that contact came from. So that way you can determine what work you are doing that's actually resulting in the most um, business for your company, especially if you have that, um, the contacts are now tied back to um, deals. 
So that's like a, a next step. Um, one thing I wanted to come back to um, earlier, someone asked about like ways that we can get um, like more use out of HubSpot, even if sales isn't as involved, or maybe they don't want to connect all of your deal information. Something that we've done um, for some of our clients here at Gorilla is we've created a field called like a like estimated pipeline or approximate pipeline. Um, so we don't have visibility into if that contact actually became like a closed one deal yet, because we're still trying to advocate that, advocate for that with sales. But we can say this was a quality lead and we believe that they would close at X amount if they did close. So that you can start getting a little bit closer to those pipeline um, conversations and talking more about like actual return on investment. One thing I, I just want to call out from the the chat as well, because um, it's a really good it's a really good call out is that um, someone said the the battle of having HubSpot as the single source of truth versus the ERP it you know is challenging because um, you lost in three separate industrial companies. Um, I'm not sure if you want to can you come off of mute and just um, expand on that a little bit. <laughs> Salim, Brad. hello, my name is Salim. I'm an industrial designer turned marketer. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, in three separate companies, uh, it has been a struggle to, first of all, integrate with old and heavily customized ERPs. That, so that that is the first uh, roadblock that I have faced with HubSpot uh, in the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, the integrations don't always go well. And it's not because of HubSpot, it's because of how heavily these ERPs are customized and how old the APIs are. And it gets to a point where uh, the ERP has been working, uh, quote unquote. So it's HubSpot's fault. And then HubSpot gets rejected. And then we implement CRM like features in the ERP and we call it a day. So, like, uh, I think that battle is less about trying to pull people away from the ERP and more about how hard in the real world, in the industrial world, it has been to get the link between HubSpot and, and these outdated ERPs, because most of these ERPs are heavily customized. They're not off the shelf. They're, they're so heavily coded internally that uh, usually HubSpot implementers have thrown their hands up and said, well, uh, uh, maybe change your ERP and link to HubSpot instead. So uh, that's just a more context to these three separate instances. Yeah, um, that's a good question and something we a challenge we run into a lot. And so I think so a lot of the bigger ERPs, right, do have native integrations like NetSuite um, for the ones that, you know, are a little bit smaller. There might be out of the box like Zapier integrations. And then for the ones that are maybe older and um, even smaller than that, um, they re do require custom integrations. Uh, but there is an open API with HubSpot. And you know, you do have the ability to do that. Now, they can get very customized and it can be challenging to get everything into HubSpot. And I think it's, it's a, it is an exercise of, of asking yourself like what, what information is, is most critical um, because HubSpot is, is not an ERP alternative. Like you, as a manufacturing company, you still need an ERP, but what information is, is most critical in getting into your CRM like um, revenue, right? And um, tying that revenue to the customers and then inventory, right? Like people expect lead times in the, ma in the manufacturing industry. Um, so inventory and kind of like shipping expectations, that sort of thing. So I think with any integration, it's, it's stripping it down to, okay, what's most important? Can we get those fields in there? Uh, if there's not a native integration, can we use um, HubSpot to, to do implementations or can we use a partner to do custom integrations? And just starting off as basic as possible. Um, it might not work every single time, but I think that that's a good way to think about it is just like, okay, what's kind of mission critical? And then if it works, build on it, build off of that and try to get those two systems, you know, working, working together. All right. We are at the end of our session today. So uh, true to form, we've covered a lot. And there's even more questions in the chat. So if you didn't get your question answered, 
feel free to join us in Slack. Just put a little note in the, if you're not already in the IML Slack community, just let us know in the chat here or DM us on LinkedIn and we will get you in. Um, but I want to just kind of circle back really quickly. Um, uh, Charlie, Brendan, I, I would love to hear what y'all think is like the big takeaway or what you think should be the big takeaway from today's conversation um, in, in from, from your point of view. Uh, Brendan, Charlie, either one of you want to go first? Sure, I can I can hop in. I, I think it's leveraging your data is is crucial. Um, the gentleman from from Mac Tech, you know, called it out. I think what he said was pretty much spot on. How can we use our data to uh, yeah make make our jobs uh, or our lives easier and uh, us more effective? No, knowing that everything's kind of moved from kind of the spray and pray like marketing approach to now a more targeted uh, approach. So um, I really like uh, Mac Tech's kind of call out there, and I think yeah, just leveraging data for really smart decisions on the marketing and sales is is my takeaway. <laughs> Crap, I should have went first. <laughs> <laughs> That was mine. But I'm gonna. So Charlie didn't pitch it, but I love using HubSpot marketing and Sales Pro just because it makes it so easy for me to get the data I need out of it to make decisions. Um, you know, across all, we use a lot of different CRMs here at at Gorilla, and I've used a bunch in my previous life in house, and it by far and away like the easiest one for me to get in there and get the things I need out of it to do my job. Awesome. Uh, yeah, for me, I think like the biggest takeaway today is, um, just about how to get your leadership team to buy in, um, to using tools like this, because ultimately you're going to save time. You're going to know where you should invest your time and you're going to know where you should invest in, um, what projects and what tactics are working. So, um, making sure that if you are running up against like roadblocks with having conversations and getting a tool like HubSpot, whether it's HubSpot or a different CRM or marketing automation tool, like reach out to your community because there are other companies, uh, like Charlie said, like there are other executives who have made the decision to like lean in to a tool like this and they can help you overcome that roadblock. So that's my big takeaway, but, uh, yeah, thanks so much for everyone for your questions. This is an awesome session. Uh, it's getting harder and harder to keep up with the chat um, all the time. So I'll be reviewing that and any questions that came in that didn't get answered, we'll make sure to uh, share them with Charlie and Brendan and we can always respond in Slack. Um, I'll definitely share the form that I had up on the screen in our Slack channel. Um, our next show, a little bit of a preview before uh, everyone jumps off. This has been a topic that's also been requested from the IML community, and we've been looking forward to it for a very long time. Um, we're going to have Jared and Beth, so if y'all want to wave, we're going to have y'all come on to talk specifically about um, marketing through distributors and marketing as a distributor. Uh, so like, how can that partnership work better? How What can we learn um, from both sides of that? And um, yeah, how can you do a better job together? So I'm really excited. That's going to be April 20th. And uh, yeah, we're going to attack that problem from all sides. Uh, like I said, join us in Slack. Super happy to see you all today and um, have a great rest of your week. Happy Easter if you celebrate. <laughs>